This is chapter 2 for those of you who are following along. Market-based thinking as a way of influencing people for the good. This is an idea that business ethicists have mulled over extensively in the last several decades, especially as markets just seem to be capable of solving such difficult social problems using the power of efficiency. So Sandel canvases in the second chapter things like paying kids to get good grades or things like paying people to be healthy, paying them to quit smoking, paying them to take their pills, to lose weight. And some of these programs are successful. Some of them are successful precisely because the amount of money involved is motivating to people to get them to do the right thing. But on page 57, Sandel talks about two questions that we need to investigate in order to ask whether monetary incentives for good behavior is really a good idea. The first question is, does it work? And the second question is, is it objectionable? From an economic point of view, he writes, the case for paying people for good health is a simple matter of costs and benefits. The only real question is whether incentive schemes work. If money motivates people to take their meds, quit smoking, or join a gym, thus reducing the need for expensive care later, why object? And yet many do object. The use of cash incentives to promote healthy behavior generates fierce moral controversy. One objection is about fairness and the other about bribery. Okay, um, cash incentives for the sake of good behavior. This exposes in a naked way the things that markets can and cannot do. Imagine that you have almost no means at all. And you receive an offer from somebody for cash payment for something that you would otherwise consider to be morally objectionable. Okay, maybe um, like the classic example would be sex, but let's say it's not that. Let's say it's something milder. Maybe you get an offer from somebody to try smoking for 30 days. Smoke a cigarette every day for 30 days in exchange for $30,000. Okay, um, this is something that a lot of us would consider to be morally objectionable. And the reason why it would be difficult to handle for somebody who doesn't have much means is because the less you have, the more coercive, morally objectionable offers seem to be. Okay, if you have a lot of means, then that wouldn't be a very persuasive offer at all. But if you have almost no means at all, that's a very persuasive offer. Capitalist markets exercise a form of soft coercion soft coercion, and it's coercion that becomes stronger the less you have. It's not hard coercion because no one's actually forcing you to do this. No one is physically compelling you or manipulating you through some uh, psychological trick like hypnotism or something. It is soft coercion, though, precisely because you feel within yourself as though you may not have another choice than to take this offer. Okay, and we could imagine some other morally objectionable thing like cooking the books for somebody in exchange for money uh, at your company. Uh, an objectionable offer for sure, but still something that might be much more persuasive the less you have. Sandel expands on that, though, and says some conservatives... Um, this is the fairness objection that he's talking about to the uh, paying for people, paying people for good health uh, scheme. He says some conservatives uh, argue that paying people to do what they should be doing anyway unfairly rewards slothful behavior. These critics see cash incentives as a reward for indulgence rather than a form of treatment. Some liberals, though, this is on page 58, voice the opposite worry, that financial rewards for good health can unfairly disadvantage people for medical conditions that are beyond their control. Okay, and so it goes. So there are some uh, substantial objections, then, to the incentives 
uh, argument and the uh, the way of conceiving of capitalist markets that is embodied in the incentivist approach to uh, social coordination problems. I want us to turn the page to page 62 to look at one other aspect of uh, the incentives issue before we unpack this fines versus fees distinction that he finishes the chapter with. Okay, and that is the perverse incentives uh, topic. Okay, so when, uh, when you get paid to do something that you should probably already be doing anyway, arguably the fact of the payment can displace other incentives that you might have. So for instance, if you are paid for good grades, rather than just seeking good grades for the sake of seeking good grades, arguably the fact of the payments, for most people at least, would displace their other incentives to do good, to seek good grades just for their own sake. Okay, similarly, if you get paid to lose weight or paid to, um, paid to, uh, to uh, do something else that you ought to be doing anyway, then arguably what will happen in such a circumstance is that the incentive scheme gets messed with by the market's influences and your incentive to lose weight on your own or to get good grades, whatever it is, is going to get messed up and um, displaced. Uh, by the fact of the money. Let's look on page 62 and look at uh, this example that he offers at the bottom of the page as an illustration of this. Sandel's a little bit all over the place, uh, but he's trying to illustrate just general points about the moral strengths and weaknesses of markets here. The example here is immigration, immigration to the United States. Immigration to the United States is a very valuable good. About 1 25th of the world has citizenship in the United States. And it's one of the most desirable citizenships anywhere in the world. Probably there are just a couple of other countries in the world that have citizenships that are in the ballpark of, equal, of being equally desirable with this. For this reason, a whole lot more people want to get into the United States than our space is available. We all know about the illegal immigration problem. There's an illegal immigration problem because legal immigration takes a long time. And there are a bunch of hoops that you have to jump through. And it's very difficult, actually, to get approval. So some business ethicists have argued, let's use market-based solutions to solve this social coordination problem. The immigration problem in the United States is quite simply a line-standing problem. A whole lot more people want a scarce good than is available of the good. So let's make it available to those who are willing to pay, some have argued. These are strong free market advocates who've argued this. Let's make it available to those who are willing to pay. If you're willing to pay enough, then you should be able to get in, buying citizenship just straight out. If you aren't willing to pay, then quite clearly you don't want that scarce good badly enough. And so you should not be able to get in. Now, apart from discrimination against refugees, this could be mutually advantageous to a variety of parties. It would be advantageous to the United States because it would increase revenue, but it would also be advantageous to those who are seeking to immigrate to the United States because presumably they would not buy the good in question, citizenship in the United States, if it weren't worth their while. So they, knowing their own situation best, presumably could make the best choices for themselves about whether or not it's worth their while to pay whatever the market rate is to get citizenship in the United States. In fact, actually, at the bottom of 62, Sandel talks about how this is already the case. In 1990, uh, well, let me just start at the beginning of the paragraph. The idea of selling the right to immigrate was offensive to some, but in an age of rising market faith, the gist of the Becker-Simon proposal soon found its way into law. In 1990, Congress provided that foreigners who invested $500,000 in the United States could immigrate with their families for two years, after which they could receive a permanent green card if the investment created at least 10 jobs. Okay, so uh, this is something that is already apparently in the law, at least to some extent in the United States, a market-based solution to the immigration problem. 
And yet this also cre creates all sorts of other difficulties. The idea of selling immigra uh, immigration spots to some people strikes a lot of non-market enthusiasts as being hard to justify, especially in the face of people who are fleeing their own countries out of persecution concerns or people who are in deeply impoverished circumstances. So the market-based solution is something that has met with a lot of resistance when it comes to a phenomenon like that. Okay, um, so that's the last example that I wanted to use to talk about the introductory comments that he has to say about incentives. I want to go to the fines versus fees distinction, but I want to see, first of all, if there are any questions or comments about any of the things I've talked about so far. Apologies if the, letter, uh, if the lecture will seem a little bit scattered today. Sandel's examples are all over the place. It would make more sense to you if you were able to read the chapter, so please do read the chapter before you take the final exam because uh, just my description of the chapter will not be sufficient to convey all the things that Sendell's trying to convey about the strengths and weaknesses of markets uh, in the course of this discussion. On page 65, though, Sendell introduces a distinction between fines and fees. A fine is a very special kind of payment because it carries with it a moral judgment. A fee does not. To be fined money is to have to pay something as punishment in a way that conveys or, or upholds the notion of moral disapproval. So fines register moral disapproval, whereas fees are simply prices that imply no moral judgment. When we impose a fine for littering, we're saying that littering is wrong, Sendell writes. The example that he uses uh, here, though, is speeding tickets, which are fines that are familiar to all of us. Who's probably paid the most for a speeding ticket of anybody in this room? Has anybody paid a uh, high, high-priced speeding ticket? Has anyone paid over $300 for a speeding ticket? Nobody? You guys are all, like, real safe drivers, slow drivers, right-hand lane. Really? <laughs> I'm surprised. What was he going? Do you know? Yeah, that's a deserved one. Officer was merciful. That's actually a bit surprising to me that the officer was merciful in his case. Generally speaking, this is totally stays in this classroom, okay? Um, police officers throw the book at young men who are speeding, but young women who are speeding get off very lightly. That's just a general phenomenon. <laughs> right, right, right. Interesting, very interesting. Speeding tickets, uh, speeding tickets are fines, not fees, because they register moral disapproval. But speeding tickets actually are punishments just to the extent that you have no means, okay? The more means you have, the less of a punishment a speeding ticket is because the smaller a percentage of your income the speeding ticket takes up. If you have hardly anything at all, a speeding ticket is a very serious punishment and you're probably going to heavily regulate your behavior after you've received the speeding ticket. Most human beings, after being punished, they comply with the rules for a while before time passes and they forget about the punishment and they begin to grow lax about their compliance. But if you have a lot of money and you get assessed a speeding ticket of $200 or whatever, it's not going to seem like much of a fine at all. It won't be especially motivating. So some have argued, let's implement market-based solutions to resolve this social coordination problem. We want people to drive the speed limit because that maximizes health and safety on the roads. 
So why not make speeding tickets correlated to your annual income? This has actually been implemented in law in some countries. The example that Sandel cites is uh, a case in the country of Finland. In Finland, the law leans hard against that way of thinking by basing fines on the income of the offender, he says. In 2003, for example, UC Salanoia, the 27-year-old heir to, so he's a, a, um, a wealthy young man, heir to a sausage business, was fined $217,000 for driving 50 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone. This would have been probably about the equivalent of $200 for the rest of us. 217000 for him. That's a really interesting idea, but the whole distinction between fines and fees runs into some difficulties. For example, try this one on for size. Sometimes, actually, the more that you require people to pay, the less they are moved by the moral disapproval of the fine. So how about this one? This is a well-known case study. Parents often are negligent, that is, they are late when it comes to picking their kids up from schools and daycares. And daycare workers, school workers have to stay late often to watch the kids. This is a social coordination problem. So some uh, daycares and schools have implemented market-based solutions to try to motivate the parents to pick the kids up on time but it's not worked the great majority of the time. Studies show that when parents have to pay, say, $30 when they've pick, they're picking their kid up an hour late, they tend to come later than they otherwise would. Why would that be? Why might, that, why might the market incentive be working the wrong way there? I might as well get my money's worth. Yeah. I might as well get my money's worth. Yeah. It feels like another good you can buy. Yeah, it feels like something you can buy. The market-based solution actually fails to register moral disapproval. Because what happens is if parents are like, I'm willing to pay that, they're going to get there on time now. Sure. Yeah, in the absence of the market-based solution, people felt shame. And the shame is what made them at least keep their behavior to some extent in check. They didn't want to feel the shame of coming so late. But when market-based solutions are implemented, that shame gets displaced and goes away. And people see it as a monetary transaction. And the market-based incentive structure displaces other motivations, causing parents to feel justified in picking their kids up later than they would otherwise do. It's a fascinating phenomenon, but it's a problem with using market-based solutions to try to incentivize behaviors that people otherwise were doing uh, out of other reasons. Okay, another uh, s several uh, examples that Sandel uh, cites here are environmental examples. These are all to illustrate the fine versus fee distinction. Okay, um, I've talked before in class about tradable pollution permits, haven't I? I think I mentioned that earlier this semester. Did I mention that phenomenon? Let me say a couple things about it real fast here. Um, on page 72, Sandel says, the distinction between a fine and a fee is also relevant to the debate over how to reduce greenhouse gases and carbon emissions. Should government set limits on emissions and fine companies that exceed them, or should government create tradable pollution permits? Uh, so this is a classic incentives problem. You want to incentivize companies to be good citizens, but at the same time, much of the time when you try to incentivize companies to be good citizens, it runs into efficiency difficulties. So uh, imagine that we've got a coal industry that's polluting too much, and the government wants to incentivize the coal companies to curb their emissions. And let's say the government also determined that a thousand blorps is the most that it can allow in carbon emissions this year out of the whole of the coal industry. There are 10 coal companies in the country. 
And one natural solution to this would be to say each coal company can pollute 100 blorps, period. 100 per company, end of story. A second solution though, a market-based solution, that's solution one, solution two, a market-based solution, would be that actually each company can start out with 100, but then to harness the power of the market, they should be allowed to trade their 100 blorps with each other. Okay, so let's imagine how such trading might work. Here are the companies in question. All right, and um, each company starts out with 100 blorps, but once trading starts, some accumulate more than others. And this company maybe finds it in its best interests to pollute 500 blorps a year. Because maybe it would be really expensive for them to implement the filtering systems and the various uh, waste reduction systems that would be necessary to get their pollution under control. These others maybe find it in their interests to trade their 100 blorps to this company or maybe 50 blorps or whatever, to reduce their emissions while at the same time making money from the exchange. You know your situation best. Each coal company knows its situation best. So each coal company, according to the cap and trade model, knows best whether it would make sense for it to reduce its emissions or to trade its emissions to other coal companies. These kinds of programs have had some success. In fact, they've had a lot of success in terms of efficiency. But they're not generally very popular with the public. Because when the public finds out about these kinds of programs, they can't seem to get around the idea that these programs give companies a right to pollute. There's something about charging everybody the 100 blorps per company approach that requires everyone to abide by the same standard that people, non-business types in the general public really like because it requires everyone to regulate their behavior to some extent. The pure market enthusiasts, by contrast, pointing to the efficiency gains of this second solution, okay, they say, no, actually, since each knows what's best in his own situation, it would be much more efficient on the whole in terms of cost savings for us just to allow trading. But it comes at the expense of the, um, the good citizen uh, feeling that comes from requiring everybody to abide by a minimum standard. Does everyone see how that works? So it's the same number. It's, it's going to be 1,000 more either way. Yeah, either way, it's a thousand blorps. Generally speaking, people outside of the business community prefer this solution where everyone has to uh, like abide, like regulate their behavior, abide by a minimal standard. But people inside the business community prefer this solution because of the efficiency gains that come at the expense of the, um, the minimal threshold standard for all the participants. It's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, it shows, though, that uh, people outside the business community tend to focus on the intangible values that are lost when market solutions are introduced, whereas people inside the business community favoring and seeing the efficiency gains that are made uh, tend to focus on that and prefer the market-based solution uh, over other options. There are a couple of last uh, examples here. Uh, really counterintuitive examples. Once markets get involved, it can really alter people's incentive structures. Let me cite one of them on page 79. This is also something from the interface of business and the environment. Okay, um, endangered species are a problem around the world. From 1970 to 1992, this is the middle of page 79, Africa's population of black rhinos fell from 65,000 to fewer than 2,500. Obviously, that's a catastrophic trajectory. 
65,000 to 2,500. Although hunting endangered species is illegal, most African countries were unable to protect rhinos from poachers who sold their horns for great sums around the world. So what happened was wildlife conservation groups in the 1990s and early 2000s began to consider using market incentives to protect endangered species. This is quite clearly a problem that's not being adequately solved by virtue of prohibition on um, poaching uh, black rhinos. Okay, if private ranchers, so the thought went, were allowed to sell hunters the right to shoot and kill a limited number of black rhinos, the ranchers would have an incentive to breed them, care for them, and fend off poachers. What do you guys think happened once the market incentives uh, solution was introduced? Does anyone want to take a guess? The population's recovered. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the market solution in Kenya, well, the, in, Ken in Kenya, there is no market solution. The hunting of rhinos is still prohibited, and the population of black rhinos has fallen from 20,000 to about 600. However, in South Africa, where there is a market solution and where landowners now have a monetary incentive to devote large ranches to wildlife, the black rhino population has begun to rebound. This is a fascinating phenomenon. Because the market solution incentivizes breeding rhinos and aligns the interests of the hunters with the interests of the breeders, whereas previously their interests were clashing with each other. Because the market does that, it brings about a more efficient, more successful result for all. Unfortunately, this comes, of course, at the cost of the moral disapproval that fines register. Because now, if the reason why the ranchers are trying to breed the black rhinos and bring about the population's recovery is just so they can get shot, that undermines the whole idea behind the original prohibition, which was that black rhinos are a special animal that ought not to be shot. Okay, does everyone kind of follow that? See how there's a trade-off there when you introduce the market solution? It looks as though it works on efficiency grounds, but it comes at the cost of the moral disapprobation that uh, is sacrificed, just like in this case, the case of the tradable pollution permits. But it's no longer endangered. No, they're no longer endangered, so it has worked, yeah. It has worked as an efficiency-based uh, solution. But unfortunately, of course, uh, people now no longer feel a sense of shame when they shoot the rhino because it's, it's now licensed as something. Uh, it would be the same thing with, uh, suppose um, Texas were to legalize hard drug use. Um, I'm talking heroin, LSD, uh, crack, uh, that sort of thing, cocaine. If Texas were to legalize hard drug use, I'm not sure if usage would go up or down. I think probably it would go up. But it would have certain advantages. For instance, a lot of the under-the-table sorts of behaviors that lead to serious health problems might go away. The sharing of needles or the, the killings that surround drug gangs and cartels. This would probably go away if it were to become just a legitimate business enterprise. But at the same time, people would no longer, because of the market solution, they would no longer feel a sense of wrongdoing when they take the substances when they ingest the drugs. They would no longer feel as though this is something that I ought not to be doing because it's fully sanctioned by the states which has implemented the market solution. Okay, it would be the same phenomenon there. All right, um, I think that's all I wanted to get out of the incentives chapter. We're going to go to uh, the, the next chapter momentarily. Are there any questions, though, about the incentives chapter before we start looking before we take a break then and start looking at gifts and um, human interaction. Let's take a two or three minute break then, and we'll come back and we'll look at the phenomenon of gift giving. If we could buy and sell children, we could match up adopting parents with parents who want to put their children up for adoption in a way that would dramatically improve the whole very long and cumbersome and bureaucratic adoption process. Wait, so whenever you adopt children, do you actually pay for the children? 
you have to pay uh, substantial regulation fees. So if you want to uh, adopt a child from China, for instance, you got to pay tens of thousands of dollars in regulation fees. Not at all. It actually like it amounts to a de facto purchase is what it what it amounts to. But it's not, of course, officially a purchase because the buying and selling of human beings feels wrong. Um, of course, it's got a sordid history and human history with uh, the buying and selling of slaves. Um, but the market based solution would bring about efficiency in this area at the cost of human dignity and human respect. Diana? Yeah, yeah. So that's the argument that the market advocates say, use is that we are actually already doing it, even though we're not officially calling it that. Because adoption requires many tens of thousands of dollars in fees that you have to pay. Yeah. Um, you know, in the world, I'll use this one other example. In the world of, uh, of egg and sperm purchases, we're basically buying and selling human beings. So if you were to enter this world, you would find that you can look through catalogs, physical and online, to identify a certain kind of person, and then you can order that person. You can order someone who, you know, you want someone who's intelligent, someone who's tall, someone who's strong, you can order people. Someone with certain racial characteristics, you can order this. And this has gone unregulated. I think it won't forever. I think that governments will step in and start regulating this world. But it is currently still a pretty unregulated world where basically people are buying and selling designer babies uh, by means of the, uh, the genetic selection process. There's some things, though, that money cannot buy. Okay, it, these are things that are, it's not the case for these things that money can buy them but shouldn't. There's some things that money quite simply cannot buy. It's not possible. Can't happen. Here's an example. The Nobel Prize. Or an MVP award in baseball. Or a championship trophy in basketball or football. Of course, you can buy the award itself. You can buy a little Academy Award statuette or an MVP Award statuette, but you can't buy the actual award. It's not possible to do that. It is beyond the calculus of markets. Market-based thinking and market-based behavior and activity cannot bring that kind of a phenomenon into its orbit. Or to take one other example, genuine friendship. You can buy somebody to spend time with you, but you can't buy genuine friendship because that actually requires non-monetary consent to be a genuine friendship. It's not the sort of thing that the calculus of the markets can actually understand. Of course, these kinds of realities don't prevent people from trying to make everything part of market-based thinking. Here are a couple of funny examples that Sendell uses on page 96. In 2001, the New York Times published a story about a company in China that offers an unusual service. If you need to apologize to someone, so say, say you need to offer an apology, and you can't quite bring yourself to do so in person, you can hire the Tianjin Apology Company to apologize on your behalf. The motto of the company is, we say sorry for you. Okay. Um, that's actually the basis for the greeting card company. Uh, I'm sorry, the greeting card industry, right? People don't know what they actually want to say in the greeting cards, so the greeting card industry steps in and offers a way for people to say it when they can't themselves uh, say the exact right thing. Uh, another example is wedding toasts. You can actually, uh, well, traditionally, wedding toasts are warm, funny, heartfelt expressions of good wishes. Uh, but actually, now there are websites that offer ghostwritten wedding speeches. You answer a questionnaire online, 
And within three business days, you receive a professionally written custom toast of three to five minutes. Um, obviously, these kinds of things are humorous, but it suggests that market-based thinking is something that people are at least trying to implement to um, bring other phenomena into the capitalist orbit. I want to focus, though, on something that I think is much harder to conceptualize as a uh, an idea as a, a phenomenon that you quite simply cannot buy and that is gift giving gift giving is a common practice of course for all of us just at ordinary times of the year but at special times of the year too birthdays christmas etc okay christmas is still a ways off for us it's about seven months off but this next christmas if you had a choice between two possibilities for gifts from your parents Okay, possibility number one, your parents give you cash. Possibility number two, your parents use that same amount of cash to purchase a heartfelt, meaningful gift that they think that you will enjoy and that captures their love for you. Who would prefer the heartfelt, meaningful gift over the cash? Raise your hand. That's less than half. Oh, no. <laughs> Who would prefer the cash? Let's make it official. Okay, so it's about half and half. Okay, um, the great majority of people outside of business circles would prefer the heartfelt, meaningful gift. Okay, in business circles, a lot of us would prefer the cash. Actually, let's hear from some of us who chose cash. Why cash? Okay. Okay. All right. You can buy whatever you want. You know what's best in your own case. Exactly. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Fair enough. Others? Anyone else who chose cash? What about those who chose the heart heartfelt meaningful gift? Why would you have chose? Why did you choose that? Sure, sure. I, 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 I would still like the $200, and I, I truly see the benefit of that. It's, uh, it's like the actual interaction with them, the, the thinking about it. Taking the time to find the gift for you, that's the meaningful part of it for you. That's powerful. That's powerful. And that kind of breaks us up about how we can get the right thing. Right. So if I get the cash, I'll buy something that we can always change together. Right. So we don't have to freak out about it. Sure, sure, sure. Interesting. Okay, well said too. That's well said. Yeah, I'm not really much of a gift person. Yeah. I think I'm a gift person. Like, if I like my relationship, and I'm not going to give you anything, I can give you what's best meaningful on money. I would have to give you a gift from him. It's not that much. Wow. Um, so the reality is no one knows us like we know ourselves. And certainly people who purchase gifts for us don't know precisely what we want, like we know what we want. Some of us would choose cash for that reason. That's a market-based reason. Okay, capitalist markets are built on the idea that each individual, each company, each entity knows what's best in its own case. Information dispersal like that where each operates on the basis of the information that he or she knows best, namely his own case, those societies are more efficient and those markets are more efficient. That's the thinking behind capitalism. But, and, 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 and one more comment on that, the reality is that uh, a lot of gifts get thrown away or returned or never used. Okay, you're too ashamed to actually throw it away. You just stuff it in the closet. Uh, I have had countless inefficient gifts over the years where I enjoy it the day it's given and then never use it again. Okay, but at the same time, a lot of us chose the heartfelt, meaningful gift knowing it's less efficient precisely because it conveys some non-monetary care and concern that our loved ones have for us. Jalansa cares about her boyfriend, wants a gift from him that's heartfelt. 
parents prefer the cash. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is a terrific juxtaposition of two clashing views of the way humans should interact with each other. One is based on values of efficiency and liberty and is, you know, it, it, it has extraordinary strengths and it has brought about great prosperity for human beings because of the efficiency gains. The other, though, is based on values of, of care and concern that can't really be captured in monetary terms and that signal to us things that are really important that are beyond price namely someone's willingness to spend his or her time and effort on your behalf in finding the gift for you. Of course, there's always the middle of the road choice can buy a gift card. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't actually recommend that, although I know it's really popular these days because it's basically just cash with limitations, isn't it? It's like, you know, I'm going to go to the effort to make sure that the cash I give you is less flexible than the cash I would otherwise be, be, will, be giving you by virtue of this gift card. In a sense, they're saying you can spend it on the frivolous score that you want to pay, and you can't, you know, you don't have to budget it. It's yeah. the shame of, like, I'm still seeing you seem to budget it, but since it only can go here, now I get to spend it. Now you get to spend it, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so, um, the... The clashing ideals here uh, are what Sandel is trying to highlight in this uh, chapter on how markets crowd out morals. And he's concerned that, he uses gift giving just as an example of this, and he's concerned that when market forces come into play, they displace other kinds of valuable uh, and worthwhile aspects of human interaction. Okay, uh, let me start reading here on page 110. Okay, and uh, this is just teasing out something that we've already talked about, but Sindel highlights it here, so I'm going to as well. Okay, these two kinds of arguments, he's uh, referring to the, uh, the fairness objection and also the corruption objection, reverberate through debates about what money should and should not buy. The fairness objection asks about the inequality that market choices may reflect. The corruption objection asks about the attitudes and norms that market relations may damage or dissolve. Okay, the fairness objection I'm reading now on page 111 points to the injustice that can arise when people buy and sell things under conditions of inequality or dire economic necessity. According to this objection, market exchanges are not always as voluntary as market enthusiasts suggest. The corruption objection is different. It points to the degrading effect of market valuation and exchange on certain goods and practices. According to this objection, certain moral and civic goods are diminished or corrupted if bought and sold. Okay, and that certainly uh, could be argued by people who are opposed to market-based thinking when it comes to the phenomenon of gift giving. There are a couple of last examples that I want to highlight in this chapter uh, before I let you go a little bit early today. Okay, one example is uh, this very interesting case of nuclear waste sites. Okay, let me just read the case for you. Um, this is coming out of uh, the country of Switzerland in Europe. Sandel writes on page 114, For years, Switzerland had been trying to find a place to store radioactive nuclear waste. Okay, few communities wanted nuclear waste to reside in their midst. One location designated as a potential nuclear waste site was the small mountain village of Wolfenschießen. Okay, in 1993, shortly before a referendum on the issue, some economists surveyed the residents of this village and asked whether they would vote to accept a nuclear waste repository in their community if the Swiss parliament decided to build it there. The facility was widely viewed as undesirable, but a slim majority of residents, 51%, said they would accept it. Apparently, their sense of civic duty outweighed their concern about the risks. Then, though, the economists added a sweetener. Suppose Parliament proposed building the nuclear waste facility in your community and offered to compensate each resident with an annual monetary payment. 
then would you favor it? That's the question they asked. And the result was that support went down rather than up. Adding the financial inducement cut the rate of acceptance in half from 51 to 25 percent. The offer of money actually reduced people's willingness to host the nuclear waste site. It felt, yeah, it felt corrupted. It felt as though this was now just some sort of a, a, um, a self-interested monetary exchange rather than a collective enterprise where some are called upon to make sacrifices and do their civic duty on behalf of the whole. That's what markets do. Markets divide people from each other. They are individualizing and they make us each think about our own interests but they separate us from collective thinking about what's best for the whole. Now this can be great. This is a great thing in some ways. It is great because quite honestly, no one in, no, in, no one in any central location is as good as you are in determining what the most efficient way is for you to live your life. It's not even close. No centrally planned economy has ever been even remotely close to a capitalist economy when it comes to the allocation of resources. But it comes at the cost of people wanting to do things like sacrifice for the common good because they now feel as though they are individuals on their own, operating on their own in the absence of some sort of a collective enterprise. As, as illustrated by the case, the nuclear waste site case. Okay, let me see if there's, I think there was one other thing I wanted to highlight in this chapter. Oh yes, okay, the last example that I want to highlight is this one. Okay, perhaps this is on page 122, perhaps the best known illustration of markets crowding out non-market norms is a classic study of blood donation. Okay, blood donation. Um, which was done in uh, 1970. The uh, researcher compared the system of blood collection used in the United Kingdom, so that is the British Isles, where all blood for transfusion is given by unpaid voluntary donors, and he compared it to the system in the United States where some blood is donated and some is bought by commercial blood banks from people who are willing to sell their blood as a way of making money. Okay, um, which system do you think actually does better at motivating people to be willing to part with their blood? The system that is purely donation-based or the system that is half donation-based, half money-based? The donation-only uh, system, yeah. And the reason why is precisely for the same reason that the nuclear waste sites uh, in Switzerland saw declining support when people were paid or were offered payments uh, to have the site in their community. The reason why is that people, for some things at least, do better at coordinating their behavior with each other when they feel as though they are making a sacrifice for the common good and participating in a collective enterprise. And that's not what markets do well. Markets do not create collective enterprises well, where people need to be motivated to see themselves as part of that collective enterprise. Okay, um, markets do great when individuals pursuing their own self-interest bring about some collective results. The, uh, the example that the great founder of capitalist markets, Adam Smith, set, uh, cited was he said, look, the, uh, the butcher who cuts my meat and offers me meat at the market does not do so out of the goodness of his heart. He does so because he wants to make money. The better he is at his job, the more money he makes and the better the experience that I have obtaining meat at the market. His pursuit of his self-interest brings about a better overall social result in that case. And some extreme advocates of markets say basically it's a situation where private vice leads to public virtue, where the pursuit of one's own self-interest, even to the extent of private vice, actually brings about a better social result. But Smith's phenomenon of the butcher who 
cares about his own self-interest and provides a better product as a result, breaks down when it comes to enterprises that need some sort of collectivist thinking in order for people to make the sacrifices necessary for the enterprise to work. And markets don't do well when it comes to stuff like nuclear waste sites or blood donation because those require, in order for the social coordination problem to be solved, those require a common feeling and markets don't encourage or promote those sorts of things. Let me stop and ask if there are any questions or comments about these uh, reflections. Thank you for your attention today. I'm going to let you guys go a little bit early, but let me say a couple things just by way of uh, summary. Okay, in this course, this semester, we've taken a pretty fast-paced look at a variety of different aspects of business ethics. We started the semester by looking at the purpose of business. And we thought about two, that from two points of view. One is the purpose of, of businesses as uh, cooperative groups. And also we thought about that from an individual point of view. What is your purpose in business as an individual? What is my purpose? We then moved to a discussion of uh, Christianity and business, and we talked about uh, how to be a Christian in a capitalist system. And I suggested, and a number of the authors we studied suggested that you can be a successful Christian, a morally and spiritually successful Christian in a system that favors self-interest. The way you do that is by looking after your own interests and simultaneously the interests of others seeking mutual at mutually advantageous trades with your customers, as it were. We then explored several different sub modules, looking at particular topics in management ethics, in finance ethics, in marketing ethics, in accounting ethics. OK, and then we finished up the semester with two special purpose investigations, one into the relationship between business and the environment, and the other this uh, special purpose investigation into Sandel, uh, what money can't buy as a way of exploring just a general purpose exploration of the moral strengths and weaknesses of markets. Okay, so this is a fast paced overview course. It's also been a course that's been uh, situated at the interface between theory and practice we have looked at concepts and then at case studies as a way of illustrating those concepts because it's a hybrid course, a hybrid theory practice course. Okay, thank you all for your attention this semester. I've had a lot of fun this semester. I've enjoyed getting to know you guys and, um, and being able to explore these topics with you guys. I'm going to say I'm not going to be seeing you guys, uh, most of you, uh, until the fall again. So let me uh, just say a real quick prayer and then I'll let you go for the day. If you want to come on Thursday, you're welcome to but it's not required, of course. Okay, so let me just say a quick prayer and then I'll let us go for the day. Lord God, I thank you for these students. I thank you for the opportunity to learn alongside them this semester. Pray that you would bless them over the next uh, week or two as they finish up their work this semester. Pray that you would give them discipline, wisdom, and strength as they complete all their assignments. And then I pray that you would give them rest this summer so that they can recover from, from the rigors of the school year. Thank you for all your blessings and for strengthening us to make the journey this far. We pray that you would strengthen us now to make it a little bit further and to do so uh, successfully. Amen. All right, go in peace. It's great to see you all. Again, you're welcome to come Thursday, but you don't have to.